Thank you so much for being with us, Lulu. And um, I want to also, uh, right out the gate, thank you uh, for your film selections. We were, uh, it was such a, a, a pleasure and uh, a really fascinating experience for us to, to discover the films that you selected to be screened alongside expats and, you know, at, at this moment when uh, we're all in the midst of discovering expats. Um, so I, I hope we can get to that a little bit later in the Q&A, some of, some of your film selections. But in the meantime, let's start with expats. Um, to, to, to kick things off, could you speak a bit about your relationship to the source material and what drew you to the project initially, um, what your re response to the novel was as a novel, and how you approached the challenge of adapting it for a serial format? Yeah, I just was, I read the novel and um, loved the way that it was non-linear. I love that it was so nuanced and textured, had all these layers, and it felt like it was an exploration of character, um, which is what I love about television as well. Like, I love diving into character, and I love when you watch something or you read something and it feels like you're pulling back the layers of an onion as opposed to just being on a train that's headed in a direction. Um, and so I think that was the challenge was to see if I could make the series also, um, you know, translate like all of those layers and texture and have it feel as nuanced. I alluded in my introduction to the choice to uh, exhibit the fifth episode. Rather than starting at the beginning of the limited series, uh, you decided uh, to exhibit theatrically the feature-length fifth episode, Central. And uh, I will say, I saw Central before I had seen any other episodes. And uh, I know that some of our audience is caught up and has seen the, the previous four episodes or maybe some selection of them. And um, others, I think, are experiencing the series for the first time. Could you speak about what your ambitions were for this episode and the, the uh, choice to sort of present it as a departure from the narrative flow of the uh, uh, the rest of the miniseries while also very much embedding it within that narrative and sort of opening up the narrative through this different perspective? Yeah, um, I think that, um, first of all, what I wanted to do with this episode was to show that there were two ways into this world and it was very experimental. <laughs> you know, I pitched it just kind of like, well, Nicole said I could do anything. So like, let's, you know, really, like have some fun and so um you know even just me teasing the idea that we were going to do an episode where she was not the main character just to see how she would respond and she was like I love that um and that was really exciting you know um and um telling it to the studio they were a little bit more trepidatious um, <laughs> but I think that you know I wanted to show that um there were two doors, you know, kind of like if you've seen the rest of the series, that you see the main entrance and then you see this other door. And for me, it was really personal because I think um, in my lifetime, like people who met me when I was an immigrant and I was a kid and they knew me in a very different way. And then people who meet me now and, you know, see me in a position um, that's much more privileged. And I spent, you know, most of my time with, you know, privileged Western Hollywood people. And so... And it's sort of like, well, you don't know everything about me. You don't know everything about these characters or people all around us in general. I think we make assumptions about people based on f impressions that we have, first impressions. Or even if you've known people for years, you might not fully know them. And so it was my way of um, kind of just continuing to expand on um, the world and peel back more layers. Like if you look at certain characters through another character's eyes, you're gonna see them differently. I think uh, part of what's so remarkable about the series is this way in which you combine or, or, or sort of marry together very sort of sweeping um, observations in these sort of 
in thematic terms about class and race and gender in this uh, in very specific sort of microcosm while also taking the microcosm itself as a real point of study and uh, uh, providing this really rich sort of naturalistic observational depiction of Hong Kong that is a cross section of life there. And I'm curious if you could just speak a bit about your approach to the city of Hong Kong or the, the, the place that is Hong Kong and what it means it's both in terms of sort of its historical trajectory, looking at the 2014 political moment, but also the, the lives of its citizens and its residents who, who populate it. And, and just could you talk about, it's a big question, but talk about Hong Kong. Um. Well, I'm no scholar of Hong Kong, but um, I think what I find and have always found really fascinating about um, the place is um, this, the, first of all, the fact that Hong Kong has never or for a very long time not belonged to itself. And it's this identity crisis that um, is a parallel to many people, individuals in diaspora. And I think that's why people relate so much to the plight of Hong Kong because um, after the handover from, you know, so there's colonialism and then it's like now there's China and it's, uh, it's this question of like, you know, who does it belong to? Who, who, what is Hong Kong? Who are Hong Kongers? And um, that struggle for identity um, is something that I really related to. And being from Beijing, like my family and I left in 1989 during Tiananmen Square. And so there's obviously that parallel as well. And so um, it was just for me about ultimately, cap like it's a, it's a place where there's an intersection of so many different types of people, as you mentioned, like class and race, East and West. And I think that that's, interesting to me because it's kind of how I've grown up like I've always had this intersection of all these different cultures but ultimately ultimately what I'm trying to say and particularly at this moment in time I think in the world is that there's a lot of tribalism and so there tends to be a lot of um, moral value like assigned to like you know class and race and all of these things and ultimately what I wanted to show was that these are all people these are all humans regardless of where you're from and you know, what your privileges are. And of course we can, you know, um, we can analyze and we can examine privilege and what that affords people and how they might behave and ways in which we're all ignorant, um, particularly people who live in a bubble and are wealthy and are privileged. But at the end of the day, it was important that they also um, deserve some level of empathy because, you know, these are all human beings. And to that point, um, it's kind of remarkable what you've done, I think, in terms of building an ensemble of characters. Um, you know, obviously it's adapted from a novel, and so there's sort of a novelistic approach to, to fleshing out this rich ensemble of characters that's also in conversation with uh, uh, the, the very sort of cinematic qualities that you're bringing to the formal presentation of these characters and how you're introducing a character matters and how your uh, uh, what we learn from them and when matters. And I wonder if you could just speak about sort of building that ensemble for the cinema in terms of both casting, how you casted, uh, uh, the, how you cast the, the the leads and the characters in this episode in particular who come to the fore where they may not have been leads elsewhere in the series. Yeah, um, you know, I think that a lot of times I'll make things because I have a question um, and then I'm like somehow trying to answer that question. And so for this series, in addition to all the thematic questions that I had, I was also asking like, what is the difference between film and television, right? Like, as a filmmaker today, you know, like, should I make film? Should I make television? And it's, and you know, oh, like, okay, if you get theatrical screening, then, then it's a film. But a lot of times it's a very short run, and then it ends up on the same screens anyways. And so what is film? What is television? Um, I don't have an answer, but <laughs> I think that I was trying to... Um, I, I didn't change my process at all in how I made this entire series versus how I 
made the farewell, for example. Um, I, you know, m my entire collaborators, my, you know, my cinematographer, my production designer, we worked in exactly the same way on a much more elevated, scaled up level. Um, and so for casting, it was the same, you know, with The Farewell and on this, we had both an American um, casting director uh, as well as international. And so we worked with um, a local casting director in Hong Kong who cast also out of Manila to get to find Ruby Ruiz. Um, so it's always this very international process and just finding who's best for the role. And, you know, the consideration for this is, of course, we have Nicole Kidman, and then we have all these actors who have never acted before. For example, like Amelin um, Pardonia, who plays... Um, uh, who plays Puri, she's a singer in Hong Kong, has never acted before. And so, and then we have, you know, Brian T, Star Yu Blue, who have done a lot of network television, and Star Yu's done a lot of, like, comedy, like, 30-minute comedies. So it was just both challenging and also really exciting to have people from all these different worlds and different experiences and um, working with them to make sure everybody felt like they were in the same film. And I think that, that diversity of experience uh, uh, parallels the sort of diversity of environments and communities that the, the show uh, studies and, and observes. And I'm curious as to uh, your research process. How did you develop these depictions of these very specific and distinctive sort of social groups, both whether Margaret and Hillary's world or Essie and Puri's professional milieu or uh, Mercy's uh, own, you know, social world. How did you, was there a research process? For sure, yeah. I mean, obviously watching a lot of films, documentaries, reading things, we, there was a lot of articles, a lot of podcasts, um, and then just being on the ground, talking to people. You know, I, um, I have friends and family there. I have um, expat friends and local friends. Um, and then with the expat friends, I asked them, you know, do you have um, a helper that would be open and, you know, interested in talking to us? And so we went to a lot of people's houses, a lot of um, expats' houses, and um, looked at just, um, you know, just looked at, like, how the, the layout of, for example, of the, of the apartment. And one thing we learned, for example, is that every um, ups, like relatively, even like not super luxury, like, you know, I would say like, you know, middle class, like apartment, they have built in like quarters, like a section, like for live in help. And that was something that was really astounding to me because that's not something that I'm used to. Um, and so, it, you know, got us really thinking about the architecture, for example, um, and, and of that, how that, how class divide is actually built into like architecture. Um, and, you know, I think the other big thing that I did was we would hire um, researchers and consultants or we would um, empower like our script coordinator to become a researcher. So we gave her double credit because, you know, she was part of the umbrella movement in 2014. And so, um, so like that kind of thing and really just a lot of conversation where I would say, hey, I know I'm the director, but please tell me if you think that I'm doing something wrong. Like, please tell me if there's a better way of doing it or a more authentic way. And so I would just keep saying that until people believed me and were less shy about it and would actually say, you know, tell me like, hey, I think the sentence structure here would be funnier if it was, I was like, great, change it. You know, and the actors themselves would do that. They would improvise and um, and I'm really grateful for that because they, you know, they have to really believe in and embody these roles. Well, I want to leave time for audience questions, but uh, before I do, I just have to ask if you could speak a bit about your film selections. That you don't have to go into detail about all of the films, but I'm curious what the process of curating this selection of films in relation to expats maybe revealed to you, or what you, what the uh, uh, takeaway you hope that audiences will bring when they watch some of these films uh, alongside expat? Um, well, in the writer's room is where um, we started finding a lot of these um, films, because we were talking about tone as we were writing the scripts. And so 
um, you know, people had seen, you know, my the writers had seen The Farewell, and I was like, well, this tone I think is going to be different. I want there to be mystery and intrigue. And so we looked at Mother by Bong Joon-ho um, as like a kind of what love, that maternal love can drive you to do. And that is, I think, we looked at a lot of films that were on the borderline that almost felt like genre, or they used genre elements, but weren't necessarily genre. Um, a White White Day was uh, recommended by, uh, by Hilnor, Hilnor Palmer, was recommended by Anna, uh, my cinematographer. Um, and that was actually um, Hilner's um, directorial debut. And I just found it to be so confident. And we really had talked about how to, because it's such an emotional um, story, we didn't want it to feel sentimental. Uh, and that was really important to us. Um, we looked at Nashville and, um, um, and I'm trying to remember the rest of the list, but. Don't Look Now is one that... Don't Look Now is another one that's like, that is a, is a genre film that's kind of genre, but, or a lot of, I mean, it's a classic that people draw from all the time now in terms of visual imagery and how striking that is. Um, and then also we wanted to make sure we were, we still kept, you know, what I love about storytelling, which is being able to do drama alongside the comedy and having light moments and having a lot of warmth still, and I think Nashville has that, has such um, a lively tapestry of characters, and there's just so much love for these characters, and the backdrop um, of music, you know, the political backdrop, um, and also that you get, you just kind of get lost watching it. It's not like you know exactly where you're going. It's, it's also a lot longer than this, but you watch it and hopefully you just kind of get absorbed into the world as opposed to being like, okay, what's going to happen next and next? And, and it's just about these people's lives. Um, and then, you know, some of the docs, of course, um, uh, Joshua, which is, uh, about the student protesters, um, and the helper, um, which you know we used obviously a lot for this episode, um, and um, don't cross that bridge, my love. Don't cross that bridge, my love. Was something we've just watched to remember the the heart and soul of you know what these stories are about. And sometimes um, we can go down this road where we're writing like drama and thriller and horror and these like dark elements, and you kind of forget the softness. And so we just wanted to remember always to have these moments where you remember why, for example, Clark and Margaret, they really love each other, even though they're in this really terrible thing, that there's warmth in these families and in some of these characters. Well, although the series is ending today, I hope that uh, if you're interest is peaked and you're absorbed in expats, uh, you can go to our website and find the list of films that Lulu selected and maybe seek some of them out. Uh, many are, you know, available for home viewing uh, if you know where to look. But um, I want to open it up to the audience now. We have a mic uh, that will be running around. So I see a hand right there already. The mic's coming to you right now. Hi, Lulu. Thank you very much for the presentation today. I wanted to ask in regards to both Farewell and Expats, you deal a lot with how people engage with grief and grieving. I was wondering as a writer and as well as a filmmaker, how do we engage with our own personal grief and translate that into what we do as, a, as, a, as an art form? Oh, that's a very deep question. Um, I, I think I'm still trying to figure that out. But I think it's just all behavior, you know? And on some level, um, whether we like to admit it or not, we all relate to all of these characters in some small way. And I think, um, or you have to at least, you know? And I think that grief is interesting because it can make you be the best version of yourself or it can make you be the worst version of yourself. And um, in a way, like loving these characters and giving them grace to behave the way that they do is also giving grace to yourself and to say, oh, 
you know, maybe, well, I don't want to have any spoilers, but the, but some of these characters behave very badly, not just in this episode. And it's like, well, maybe, you know, I've done that too, right? Like, I've accidentally been rude to somebody because I, you know, am, am struggling with a loss or grief or something um, that uh, that has overtaken me. And, and, and then you're really hard on yourself, but it's like, you know, we're all human. So... Um, I think that, that that's the process that it taught all of us, like the writers and I, as we were writing through this, it's like, oh, God, yeah, I've, I've done that. It's so embarrassing. All right, let's give that to this character. Thank you for coming here. Um, I just want to ask, one of your responses, you said um, you were like, visiting homes that had like accommodations built for like live-in help. Um, it reminded me of an answer you gave, uh, I think, at an interview with NPR a few years back about how you started your career make, make filming these like day of day in the life of videos for injury victims, um, for like court cases, mediation, and you would like visit people in their homes, get them to open up and kind of, you know, produce these short films about them. Um, do you think that process um, sort of influenced how you approached this episode, like either how you shot it or how you did the research for it or both? Oh, that's interesting. I haven't thought about that, but I'm sure, I'm sure it has, you know, um, just like going into, I think both like that job and also just always feeling like you're a guest somewhere, you know, <laughs> like that's what, at least my immigrant parents are like, you're a guest in this country. Um, so you have to, you know, be a certain way or behave, you know, behave well or whatever. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, that experience definitely taught me a lot about empathy and how to get people to open up and how to disarm them. Because with that job, it was like a lot of lawyers um, and that they were used to dealing with all these like men in suits and there it, it's hard to like for them to open up and a lot of them um, had never like been in that world before and so for me and I think that's where you know I'm five foot tall and you know I <laughs> I am who I am and so um, I would intentionally lean into that I would come in and just be like forget about the lawyers and um, just talk to me, tell me what's going on. And so I do that a lot here too, like even going um, to a lot of the Filipino community and saying, hey, this is the storyline, this is what I'm trying to do, but I want to make sure I'm doing it as accurately as possible. So I want you to take control and take authority of this story. Hi, thank you. Um, my question was mainly in terms of adapting the novel. I'm unfamiliar with the source material, but... I was very curious in how, when you were writing the teleplay for the show, especially in this episode, you see these characters as something they're all desperately searching for something. Um, how important was it for you to subtly show love as something they need, but more so through the lens of something as love being transactional? Oh, interesting. Um, how they, how it is transactional, or they need it um, to not be transactional? Or, or more so just how it can come off as transactional, especially for the characters who are mainly the help. You know, yeah. you talk about class, and to them, it's very, I thought, as something like, oh, they're my friend, they're caring, but, you know, you're being warned. They are your boss, and there's yeah. certain boundaries, and how, at the end, they ultimately do not care. You're their employee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that was something that um, we, t we talked about a lot in developing the script was just like whose perspective are you in? Because I fully, fully believe that Margaret thinks that Essie is family. Um, and, you know, you'll keep watching hopefully the next episode. But, um, but I think that that's the gray area, right? Is like who has the privilege of thinking the, that you know in that way and who doesn't because there is a power dynamic whether or not these employers like it or not and it's their own own way I think it's also a very western thing of like this is how I'm gonna like calm my own guilt there's this like western Christian um, ideology that they're bringing in of like well we're not bad people you're right, it's, this is just the system. And I heard that so much when I was in Hong Kong. It's like, well, this is normal here. We wouldn't, of course, we would, this is, I know this looks bad in the States, but here, this is, this is, like, actually, this room is so much better. You should see how other people's helpers' rooms are. You know, so there's that, like, trying to make themselves for, feel more easy about these um, decisions. Hi. Uh, I noticed a 
a uh, big difference in the adaptation here is that there's a lot more time spent on giving uh, the character of David like agency and development. Could you speak on uh, why you chose to do that? Um, well, <laughs> I think I wanted to make sure we were giving, you know, we were like treating the men fairly. <laughs> I'm, I'm very much about fairness. Um, uh, even though life isn't fair. Um, but, you know, we, we wanted to make sure, we, like, all the men weren't just bad. And I think that, you know, because David is the closest to a villain in this, um, and he makes a lot of bad choices, but I, was, I wanted to make sure he was still empathetic. Um, I also think that when we started shooting the coffee s scene, um, I couldn't stop. And they were like, we've now spent two days shooting this man carrying a coffee machine. And I was like, but it's so funny. It's going to make the whole series. And the producers were like, but this is a show about these women. And he doesn't really have a storyline. It's just him and the coffee machine. I was like, yes, but it's so good. Um, it says so much also about it, his character. It does, right? About men sometimes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it's charming, you know. I think we have time for one more. I see a hand right here. If we have the mic, yep. Regarding your rehearsal methods um, with all these actors, especially because they come from different backgrounds and different levels and also non-actors. Um, yeah, how did you approach the, rehears the rehearsals usually? Well, we didn't have a lot of time for rehearsals. Um, and, I, and I like having rehearsals. I've yet to get it in my career because it costs you know, time and money and oftentimes you just don't have that as a luxury. Um, but I think that um, I would encourage certain actors to spend time together, like Clark um, and so um, Nicole and, and, and Brian. I would tell them to spend as much time as they could together and the kids so that they really felt like they were bonded. And that was important for all of them as well. Um, and then I told certain other people to stay away from each other. I told Nicole and Ji Young, who plays Mercy, to like not really know each other so that when they met on set and um, you know I think the first scene that they shot together was was at the night market when sorry I'm that's a spoiler sorry was when Gus goes missing is the scene where Gus goes missing and so they really didn't know each other and I think that that sense of them being strangers and this massive thing happening um, really comes through and then I think the most rehearsals that I did was with the um, Filipino community, um, these women, um, just because there is this sort of liveliness and it has to feel really lived in. And, and so we actually did do a rehearsal um, where they helped, where, you know, like they're talking on top of each other and they would all argue, no, 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 we wouldn't say it like this. How about if we say it like this? And that was so great. And I was just like, couldn't take notes fast enough. And we had a translator and a consultant. So that scene just kept developing as they rehearsed it because of the improv that they were doing. Well, I'm sorry to say that's all the time we have, but if you want more Lulu, uh, stick around. We're showing The Farewell at 9.15, and Lulu will be back to introduce that screening, so don't go far. Thank you all so much, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.